we are very fortunate here in Greece. Since antiquity, we have had countless giants who have not been afraid to follow in the footsteps of such figures as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. These modern titans of learning continue our people's traditions in literature, history, science, the arts, political thought. They continue to teach us, to inspire us, to deepen and broaden our understanding and appreciation of these things that make our lives so much better. One of our most important teachers over the past decades has been Sarandos Yota Cargakos, who passed away recently. Born in 1937 in the seaside town of Githio, just south of Sparta, his generation's character was forged in the fires of the brutal Nazi invasion of the Second World War and the even more brutal civil war that erupted in Greece after the German defeat. From his early academic years, he gave many fearless political battles, always standing up for what he knew to be just. Even in the face of the dictatorship that took control of Greece in the late 60s and 70s, Karagagos was not afraid to speak his mind, do what he thought was right, and he always stoically paid the price. A historian and philologist, he taught for over 35 years in many esteemed institutions here in Greece. He was the author of over 60 books on history, literature, educational matters, politics, and world travel. Like a modern-day Homer, he was a mesmerizing storyteller. He brought to life stories of ancient battles, victories, and tragedies. He'd fill our minds with tales of romances, pirate invasions, clashing armies. For this talent, he became a very sought-after public speaker. And in recent years, he blessed us with a series of fantastic lectures on ancient Greek history, leading all the way up to the events after the Second World War. My name is Chris. I'm a travel specialist with the Greek Travel Gurus. I plan tailor-made trips to Greece. I'm not a historian or a philologist, but thanks to teachers like Sarados Kargakos, I've acquired a deep appreciation for our history and our traditions. I've taken it upon myself to translate these lectures into the English language and share them with you in the form of podcasts. With your support, I aspire to honor this great teacher. If you want to follow me on my journey through the history of Greece, just hit that subscribe button and you'll be notified about every new episode. And if you want to plan your trip to Greece, maybe visit some of these places that we'll be talking about, like Athens, Sparta, Thermopylae. Just visit my website and send me a message. Persian Wars, Chapter 1, The Ionian Rebellion. Great Persian Wars, or Midiki Polemi, as they are still known in Greek, are a series of famous battles which took place between Greeks and invading Persians from 492 BC to 479 BC. As with all major events in history, these wars did not just come about by chance they have a history of their own. In this case, they are connected to the rebellion against the Persians that took place in the Ionian states of Asia Minor, beginning 10 years earlier. The Ionian rebellion has its own prehistory, of course. The Persians first arrive in Asia Minor around 540 BC but the Ionian cities had long before created the first cradles of Greek civilization in that region. At that time, the Persian Empire was expanding west, and under the leadership of King Cyrus the Great, the Persians overran the Ionian cities. In turn, 
the Ionians decided to ask for help from their mother cities in Hellas, something that was far from feasible at the time. We know that an emissary of the Greek city of Phokea managed to reach Sparta and petition for help. The Spartans, not at all accustomed to waging distant wars across the seas, were not eager to lend assistance. They did, however, send a Pendicondoro, which is a ship with 50 oars. They sent this ship to assess the situation in Ionia. Leader of this small expedition was a man by the name of Lacrinis, a prominent and capable Spartan. He reached Phokea and then proceeded many miles inland, all the way to Sardis, where he met with King Cyrus. Herodotus, or Irodotos, tells us that he gave the great king the following ultimatum. Do not dare lay hands on any Greek city. The Lacedaemonians will not allow it. Cyrus was taken aback. He asked his consultants, what kind of people are these Lacedaemonians and how many of them are there? When he was satisfied with the intelligence provided, he reportedly joked, if God gives me health, I will bring such anguish to the cities of Hellas that they will have no time to worry about their brothers in Ionia. But it appears that Cyrus already was focused on other endeavors and he soon forgot about the Spartans. Many years passed, Ionia was conquered, and we come to 515 BC. Darius I is now king of Persia, a grand king and conqueror, creator of an impressive civilization. His plans included the acquisition of Scythia. The Scythians were an ancient warlike people who lived between the Danube and the Volga rivers fierce and hardy warriors who in their own rights developed an impressive civilization. Very different from the Persian and Greek civilizations, but impressive nonetheless. Darius set forth in 515 BC bringing with him the Greek tyrants and armies of the puppet states in Asia Minor and Thrace. Among them, the tyrant of Miletus, named Istieos, and Miltiades, the tyrant of Thrace, who was later immortalized at the Battle of Marathon. At the Hellespont, Darius crossed the bridge, which he had ordered the fine engineers from the island of Samos to construct. He reached the Danube, at that time known as the Istros River. There he crossed yet another bridge, erected by his navy which preceded his march. He left the Greek armies in the rear, to guard the bridge. His orders were that, if he had not returned within sixty days, they were to destroy it and return to their cities. His aim was to defeat the Scythians swiftly and then circle back around the Black Sea to return home by land. 
Utilizing tactics of retreat and scorched earth, however, the Scythians lured Darius into the furthest northernmost reaches of their lands, where they proceeded to decimate his armies. While Darius was tied up in distant war with a formidable yet intangible foe, a posse of Scythian cavalry appeared to the Greek rear guard at the Danube Bridge. They prompted the Greeks to destroy the bridge so that Darius would be trapped and ultimately destroyed. The Greeks debated the idea. Mediavis urged them to destroy the bridge, but Istios refused to cooperate. He insisted that the bridge remained standing. Thus Darius was able to return to his kingdom with what little forces he had left. As you can imagine, Isthias gained the favor of Darius, but Mildiavis could no longer remain at his position of tyrant of Thrace. He quickly resigned his post, so to speak, and escaped to his real home back in Athens. But it would be foolish of us to think that this setback would be enough to discourage Darius. He was not only interested in the lands of the Scythians, after all. He wanted the whole of Europe. His first goals were the Balkans, and especially the lands of Greece. To continue his dream of expansion, he appointed a general named Megavazos, and endowed him with an army capable of conquering Thrace and Macedonia. At the time, these northern regions of Greece were ruled by King Amindas. Megavazos was successful in taking northern Hellas. And so, we have the first Persian foothold on European soil. And now, we come to the Ionian Revolt. Istios, as we said, was now Darius' favorite puppet tyrant in Asia Minor. And as such, he gained a certain level of autonomy. But Darius was always cautious not to bestow too much freedom or power on any of his vassals. So when his advisors informed Darius that Istios had become somewhat defiant, the great king employed the age-old tactic of the golden chains. In other words, he invited the tyrant to his capitals, Susa and Persepolis. The Persian kings, of course, had two capitals, one for the summer and one for the winter seasons. Istios was provided with everything that he could desire in the court of the grand king everything that is except for his freedom. Istios began feeling the pressure very soon, and he managed to establish a secret channel of communication with his brother-in-law, Aristagoras. Aristagoras had replaced him as tyrant of Militos. In order to send an encrypted signal to Istagoras, Istios ordered a slave to be brought to him. He had the slave's head shaved, and on it he wrote a message calling for an uprising in Militos. He hid the slave in his quarters for weeks, until his hair had grown back, and then he sent him forth to Aristagoras. The slave had instructions to tell the tyrant to have his head shaved anew, so that the message could be read. But why was this rebellion called for? Surely it was about much more than the plight of a Greek tyrant. This alone would not be enough to cause an uprising among the people of Ionia. In reality, 
It was not only the matter of subjugation to the Persians, not only the desire for freedom and independence, there were also financial considerations. Ever since the Persians had engulfed the Phoenician lands to the south, they had granted them the sole mercantile rights to all the vast Persian Empire. A ruthless competition arose for dominance in the Mediterranean. The Ionians and other Greeks on one hand, the Persian-backed Phoenicians on the other. At the time, the Phoenicians had gained the upper hand in the eastern Mediterranean. Their colony, Carthage, on the northern shores of Libya, also had a tight grip on the western Mediterranean. This rivalry was one of the basic reasons behind the Ionian Revolt. This, along with the growing dissatisfaction that the Ionians felt toward the tyrants appointed by the Persian king. The spark that set it off, however, was a failed expedition that Aristagoras led against the island of Naxos. Knowing that he would be held accountable to Darius for his failure to take Naxos, he incited the rebellion among the Ionian city-states, with of course the approval of the still-detained Istieos. Help was needed. The Ionians could not throw off Persian dominance on their own. The Athenians and the people from the city of Eretria, being of the same Ionian tribe, agreed to help. Eretria sent five ships, and Athens, being still a far cry from the formidable naval power that they would become in later years, could only spare another twenty ships. Athenian involvement, however, would be cut short after a gross defeat at the city of Ephesus in 497 BC. In his quest for aid, Aristagoras traveled all the way to Sparta. The Spartans, being of the Dorian tribe of Greeks, were not impressed with the way that he pleaded his case he was hastily escorted out of the city. And so, the Ionians had to bear the weight of the rebellion on their own. They still had the element of surprise. The uprising began in 499 BC, and it would last until 493 BC, with the ultimate fall of Militos. At first, the movement was successful and it spread out from the Bosporus to the southern shores of Asia Minor and all the way to the island of Cyprus. One by one, the Greek cities of Asia Minor declared their independence from Persian rule, and battles ensued all through the region. But taking advantage of the Ionians' lacking coordination, the Persians were able to quickly put together an army and claim a first significant victory against the Ionians at Ephesus in 497 BC. When the Greeks first liberated Ephesus, they had made a terrible blunder. In their zeal, they set a fire to the temple of Kiveli. This put off the Persians and other non-Greek inhabitants who in turn did not support the liberating Greek forces. In later years, Xerxes remembered this act of folly and used it as an excuse to destroy the temples in Athens. The tides of war were slowly turning against the Greeks. The only hope that they had left was their sizable navy, which comprised of 453 ships in total but they had to stand up to about 600 ships, mostly Phoenicians, under Persian command. The Ionian fleet gathered near a little island off the coast of Militos, an island called Lavi. The island no longer exists. It has long since been connected to the mainland by the soil and sediment 
brought down by the nearby rivers. However, you can still see a mound where the island used to be. The Ionian leaders convened at the Temple of Poseidon at the tip of Cape Mikali. Banking on their long naval traditions, they agreed that they could defeat the Persians at sea. But it was apparent that they lacked a central command. They appointed Dionysius from the city of Phokea. He was a competent, dynamic, but rather coarse leader. Seeing that the Greek navy was out of shape and that they lacked training in tactics, Dionysius implemented a rigorous training program. This did not sit well with the troops who were not motivated and used to taking orders. Herodotus tells us that the troops were inclined to spend more time in the shade on the nearby beaches rather than preparing for the coming battle. So since Dionysius only had three ships of his own, he was quickly relieved of his command and every city took charge of their own ships within the coalition. To compound to their lack of discipline, the Ionians were also much too eager to return to their homes. This led them to a most tragic blunder. Rather than waiting it out, selecting a site where they would have the strategic advantage, forcing the Persians to come to them, they initiated a reckless and poorly planned first strike. The Persians, on the other hand, were much better prepared. They had been working hard at creating division among the Ionian ranks and installing a fifth column which would be activated at the appropriate time. Just before the final battle began, first the fleet from Samos and then the fleet from the island of Lesbos about faced and sailed for home. Only the fleet from the island of Chios remained with the Miletians to give the final battle. The Hians fought valiantly, at one point breaking the Persian line and capturing many ships, but they sustained many losses of their own. Eventually, the remaining Hian ships sailed away. Four ninety four BC, the naval battle of Lavi. What's left of the Ionian fleet is destroyed. The mighty naval power that they once wielded in the Aegean and Black Seas comes to a tragic end. After the victory at sea, the Persians proceed to lay siege to the city of Militos. Militos was the most significant city of this period, home to many prominent sages and poets. The city had ceded over 60 colonies around the Black Sea and another 20 in the Sea of Marmara and other areas around the Mediterranean. Militos withstood the Persian siege for close to a year, but alas, it fell and it was razed to the ground. It is said that the population was all shipped off into slavery, as far away as the Persian Gulf or the Red Sea according to Herodotus. It is possible that many of them survived by fleeing to the nearby mountains. We know this because we will encounter these survivors later on, in an episode where they take revenge on the Persians. As we noted earlier, the Athenians had already recalled their ships after a major defeat in Ephesus, four years earlier. So they did not take part in the final naval battle at Lavi. When the news that Militos had been destroyed reached Athens, it caused great anguish among the people of the city. This news inspired the first great playwright of antiquity, Phrynichos. He wrote his tragedy, The Fall of Militos. Herodotus tells us that when the play was presented to the Athenian public, it was so touching that everyone burst into tears. 
mourning the once great city that had opened the road to the Greek dominance of the seas. The city officials of Athens imposed a thousand drachma fine on Phrynichos, because in his play he proceeded to remind the Athenians of their own faults in this tragedy. The real reason for the fine, dear listener, was much deeper. A divide was growing in the city. There was a portion of Athenians who could foresee that it would not be long before Persia would turn their gaze upon them. They wanted to embrace the city's destiny as a growing naval power. Phrynichos used his play to express these concerns. It was not long before this faction found a natural leader under the name of Themistocles.